Welcome to the Conscious Combat Club, trauma-informed martial arts by women for women. I'm your host, Georgia, and I cannot wait to go on this journey with you. Please note that some listeners might find this content distressing. Take care, connect with your support networks, and refer to the organizations in the show notes below. Before you start listening to today's awesome episode, you might like to check out the show notes and register for the free webinar that we're running on February 2nd at 8.30 Melbourne time, which is called The Combat Athlete's Body Keeps the Score. Now, today's episode is a episode within the segment that we call fight science um, and so this is where i interview researchers about their work to make it accessible for you in today's episode i interview dr george jennings a senior lecturer in sports sociology at cardiff metropolitan university in the uk George's research explores martial arts and combat sports health and society and he has written a whole book which is called Reinventing Martial Arts in the 21st Century. So here is me trying to make that book more accessible to you because it is an academic text that is a little bit expensive to purchase and you might not have access to a university library or someone who can get it for you. Um, so for the too long didn't read of his book, listen to the podcast. So. George, we start off this book building up to the definition that you've created about what a martial art is. I'm going to read it for everybody and then I'd love to take it apart a little bit because there's a lot there. So a martial art is an imaginative, adaptable system of physical human fighting techniques designed in order to deal with perceived problems in combat and society. So if we keep in mind, um, trying to imagine that we're speaking with a 14 year old, yes. how would we explain this definition? So maybe we want to go through kind of in order. So what does it mean to be an imaginative, adaptable system? OK, thanks. Great question. Let's break this down, this wordy definition down. Um, essentially, if you think of a lot of martial arts, they um, do rely on the creator's and teacher's imagination. So a lot of martial arts were created with people have a, a vision for combat. So it may be, for example, Aikido, which they tried to use a circle, adapted um, techniques against a sword, for example, swords, and used it for um, unarmed combat and to uh, be more of a kind of pacific or non-violent martial arts, which you wouldn't necessarily hurt a person directly through striking so that's more using someone's vision so how can we be creative and um, based on my values based on what we need to do and it could be adaptive you know adaptable because we might need to adapt the martial arts for different circumstances and um, for example new regulations or perhaps when it becomes a it could become a sport it could move into a kind of a health field so it could be a form of exercise or movement for well-being it could also be something for uh, you know, social kind of what we say integration getting people together um so martial arts can be used for many purposes because they're so rich in technique and so rich in movements and methods mm. do you think that <clears throat> yes is that adaptableness intentional so it's is it do you think it's that there's a person or group of people who are thinking i'm going to adapt this system so that it is you know better for creating community or i'm going to adapt this so that it becomes a sport or is that something that happens naturally or as an afterthought i think it's probably the second bit it's probably generally an afterthought because any founder of the martial art probably wouldn't perceive it to be the way it is today it's often when mm -hmm. they pass away or they age and the, the, the control they lose maybe they actually relinquish or let go of control of the martial arts and the next generation or the generation after that they probably wouldn't imagine the kind of politics and infighting that sometimes happens in martial arts groups at the same time how people might think actually i'm going to take this and use it for things that you're doing for example the trauma-informed martial arts so maybe the original founders of uh, a karate style or kickboxing or muay thai or they wouldn't never have imagined it being used maybe for uh, women and who experience domestic violence but other people in later generations can because they have imagination based on their experience and their observations and that links to the later bit of the definition of the problems in society you know mm -hmm. that we have different problems or, or highlighted problems that we have words for them as well like trauma which we probably then perhaps they didn't have this kind of words um hundreds of years ago 
well, they may have, but they may not be in, in the, the forefront of people's minds. And is that why you use the word perceived problems? Like what's the difference between a problem and a perceived problem? Yeah, that's good. So the perceived is something we then we have the intentional aspect of it. So um, the founder or the innovator, so someone who creates maybe a style from a martial art or adapted mm -hmm. system, normally perceives it to be to, there is a problem out there that we need to adjust to. So maybe there's a, something for martial arts, for example, for people with neurodiversity. So how can we adjust or adapt this? Now we know more about neurodiversity with autism, maybe HD and things like that. Um, than we did say 30, 40, 50 years ago. I perceive this to be you know, a problem for the learner. I mean, society needs to adapt for the people because there are always going to be people with differences. We can then, then I, and perhaps they perceived it because they themselves have, have lived with that or those in their family or their friends, so people in their, their circle, inner circle, should we say. Oft, often martial arts is quite personal. So people adapt things because they are, uh, you know, maybe they're they have the same gender or they may be the same nationality or ethnic group where they hail from a certain ancestry where they, they feel connected to that and they perceive that as being important. I think yeah. normally. It's so interesting too how it relates to combat. You can see when you get into studying different martial arts how the the founders or the idea is to address a specific problem you know mm -hmm. like jujitsu is to address the problem of fighting one person mm -hmm. maybe yeah. not multiple people other styles are more focused on multiple attackers but in one-on-one -on -one combat they might be less effective or whether it's with a weapon or without mm -hmm. a weapon or you know overcoming certain problems within um a rule set or like you know capoeira problems within what they were allowed to do and not allowed to mm. do it's definitely. fascinating it is definitely really, really good examples there i think um yeah because the uh, combat's so complex isn't it because you could have weapons that a short or long uh, projectile weapons they could be um on the on the ground it may also depend on the culture in question where they, you know, they accept grappling on the floor and some martial arts are based on kind of honor culture where you hit someone knock them down that's the end of the fight and other cultures are going to the floor is, is almost expected um so definitely i think it's the combat there's almost them now we know there's other martial arts created and other martial arts might be created to counter that or that another style that is aware of this exists this other style existing so it has to factor that in and adapt again yeah. yeah and in the definition you specify physical human fighting techniques yes. why did you include physical okay thanks um because i know there are debates about for example video games being a martial arts or a computer game so which of course they're very enjoyable and they could be educated you could learn things from video games and they can inspire you to actually uh, take up uh, a martial arts uh, but i have a conversation with other martial artists and a lot of them the, dismiss the idea that they are martial arts and therefore the, the players are martial artists. So when I was a kid, for, actually I, I played uh, martial arts games before I, I practiced martial arts. So in primary school, my friend and I used to play Turtles and then Street Fighter. So we did play martial arts related video games. And then I took up martial arts a few years later. Um, but I'm pretty sure I wasn't a martial artist, <laughs> you know. So the physical aspect was to emphasize that you're actually doing martial art with your body. Although of course you can visualize and use imagination and um, we know for say sports psychology, this could help for your performance. You might think about doing a technique if you're injured. Definitely there is that. But you can only do that because you've had that physical basis of the doing the technique. And then you can go hopefully go back to do it. To, you can resume your training, uh, physical training and movement. So, again, that links to the latest chapters on movement as well, the importance of movement in martial arts. Yeah. And, I mean, this book really looks at ways that martial arts can address problems in society through the body. It's a very embodied journey that I think you take the reader on where all of the themes at the end of the day, the thing that they have in common is that they're doing something um, with the body. So the first thing that you talk about is, you know, this idea about art. I was actually going to ask you this last, but I think the order that you had it in the book is just bang on. It makes sense. Know, so, uh, we talk about martial arts um, versus combat sports. Hmm. And maybe there's a spectrum between martial arts that are arts yes. um, and sports. But is there a line? Where is the line? Is it more spectrum based? Can can we explore that a little bit? Yeah, I think yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, I know there's there's a lot of um, acronyms. That we, I remember in your your training events, the MAC, so, so martial arts and combat sports. Um, this acronym is quite popular these days. And sometimes another, I think the French, they have got combat sports and martial arts. Um, so, um, so the terms show there's a, probably is a difference, 
because people are thinking about them and we have these t these words. Um, but at the same time, I think there's um yeah definitely a spectrum is probably a good way of looking at it or a continuum. So for example, I mentioned karate or say or you could say taekwondo. So people could do taekwondo as a martial art um, for all their life and um, learning the focus on maybe on the patterns and the values and the traditions and the, the language and all the kind of um, aspects of Korean culture, perhaps uh, that expressing it as an art into the body. Or you could um, kind of strip that away and, and focus more on the fitness, the conditioning, the, and then maybe a short um, career when you're relatively young, maybe 20s and 30s, no more really than 40 probably, um, and your competitive, high-level competitor, as an most athletes are in westernized sports, so and then the Olympics and the kind of the ranking system. So, so you could, but you could then also then change from a sporting career to then resume a martial arts journey later when you're older. So it's not that you you just you're, you're a combat sports person that's over you can move in between both of them and you might even be doing both so you might be doing um you know it might be an amateur boxer but also a, a tai chi practitioner or a capoeira practitioner and i know people can use both there's two different vehicles but some because one might uh, participants talk about stepping off a vehicle so you could be on the sporting vehicle for a while but you may then go on to another vehicle in your your journey through life um, and one of the things in the book i mentioned was the um, longevity of martial arts is that you should be able to practice it all your life so for example painting or playing a musical instrument or poetry or the, these kind of arts you should be able to do it into your 60s 70s 80s depending on how you like long you live but even possibly your 90s etc but and, and martial arts many of them can be adapted and they're intended not to have a retirement point because it is a lifelong practice and um, whereas of course sports most of them have a, a necessary retirement point even though there might be some masters uh, them for example tournaments they may also maybe about bodily damage so if you carried on say boxing full contact all your life so how do we know that it's bad for the brain so like rugby and other other contact sports as well there's more re research now on dementia and alzheimer's and um, concussion so the impact of concussion on your long-term health but at the moment there's no cure for so it could be quite dangerous so by doing uh, combat sports and sparring and fighting very re regularly and get full contact you could have end up having some damage whereas other you know, if you're doing some pattern or movements kind of base system a more cooperative exercise where there's no direct hit on the brain, then it's more likely you can sustain that. And that's that's more of the arts kind of spectrum of martial arts and combat sports. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I think a lot about questions like this through the lens of the work that we're doing at the Conscious Combat Club. Mm -hmm. And if I ask like, well, are we a martial art or a combat sport? Mm -hmm. And I really think it's so contextual because on the one hand, I talk a lot about learning kickboxing through the lens of it being a sport mm. um and intentionally avoiding the self-defense applications mm. in most cases particularly because we're not wanting to go into scenarios for the potential that that might have to be triggering or overwhelming mm. for somebody yeah. and you could definitely make the opposite argument mm. so then thinking about it as more of an art though because we're also not sparring we're not training it to ever compete in the sport we're training mm. for the sake of honing a set of skills like having the you know the most satisfying roundhouse kick where it both you know looks powerful and feels powerful when it makes contact um with something um, and that's why i think it's like different on a different day and it's so mm. fascinating yeah. as like someone who's trained in you know more the art style so in karate and then in you know more sport where you're going through cycles as a professional athlete cycles as in you know preparing for a competition having the competition resting is probably yes. you know the the classical cycle yes. yeah I, I don't know how i conceive myself and the work that i do yeah i think it's really interesting i remember your biography you started off in karate didn't you then muay thai and brazilian, brazilian jiu-jitsu these days so you've got I think arts that do have a competitive aspect, but they are they have a history of them um, or precursor, you know, previous versions that were more on the arts level. So Brazilian Jiu Jitsu came from judo, which came from Jiu Jitsu. Muay Thai would have been trained for the, the military and to guard the king, the Thai king, and so it has a history of being probably more of an art. And and there's still elements of that which you can, that would now is it to be adaptable and to change. You don't have to just go down this pure sporting route based on a certain set of rules. Yeah. 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 I think so. Yeah, well, that's very... thinking. Thank you. Hopefully, the definition helps you think. It starts debate and gets people thinking, reflecting. It doesn't have to be set in stone. And it may, you know, who knows? In ten years' time, it might be. I might revise it and then adapt it myself because with, with new learnings. Yeah. yeah, and I think the 
the more time that I spend in complex concepts like things related to the martial arts, the more I look at things as a spectrum. Even in terms of techniques, I think it's really easy to have like a black and white answer, like when this happens, you do this. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, most things in our societies exist on a spectrum and are a little bit more in the gray. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, or answers like, well, it depends if, mm. you know, it depends what your opponent's doing. It depends what you've been doing leading up to that and how much energy that you've got. It mm. depends on what the goal is of the technique in this particular case, it depends mm. on the rule set that you're competing in, um, which is more tiring for the brain, not to just have one answer, you know, yeah. you know, to learn yeah. one thing, you've got to learn yeah. hundreds of things and apply sound reasoning to you know the ideas about why you're doing things but it is fun definitely and it keeps us learning because if we did have everything in the box ticked very quickly we've probably finished our martial arts training in a few years but because we're still mm. learning to adapt you know the roundhouse kick could this be a sweep could it be actually a block could it be a, a way to develop your hip strength and control could it be adaptive for people with balance issues and you could start playing around with this technique all your life rather than say it's only for this yeah, yeah. I love the other or one of the other problems in society that you look at the potential for martial arts to help address is what we term sedentariness. So mm -hmm. our tendency to have moved away from accessing the full range of motion of our bodies, yeah. not just that we spend too much time not moving, but that we spend so much time in a static posture that too often is sitting at a desk or on a chair or in a car um, and how that can lead to musculoskeletal issues. So issues with our bodies, our bodies break down because we're not using them to their fullest extent. So what are martial arts movement systems? How do they help address this issue of sedentariness? And can you give us, or can you explain that with a couple of examples? Yeah, sure. Thanks. A very really important point there. So then, yeah, we definitely know that people are sitting for too long in certain areas or or even maybe standing in, is probably too much in, in a static way can be also bad for you. Uh, martial arts in themselves have a lot of movement, but they also have some stillness embedded. So especially those with patterns or forms, you may need to start in a standing position, they finish in a standing. So it indicates that standing is important, being still, but also then moving through this and, and blending so i think martial arts have a range of interesting motions so you go forwards you go backwards you go sideways you go up and down you twist and turn there's spirals and each martial art may emphasize certain techniques and, and directions of motion and principles but within that within the breadth of martial arts um, you have lots of different ways of moving which can help people access those things so for example you could have even if you are said based on a desk-based job you might have um, and you'd be typing on a computer there's lots of hand ex wrist exercises from different martial arts. So you might think the Chinese martial arts particularly use a lot of animal kind of techniques, which could be adapted for health. There's not necessarily to, to fight with, but you could be using like a, a claw or you could use a kind of hook kind of position like in Tai Chi. And you could work with, you know, bringing those fingers together, and even that you're holding this for 10 seconds. So you, you're doing, you're making a, yes, yeah, a static motion. You could also use dynamic motions. For example, now I'm opening and closing my hands Rapidly, this is also using Tai Chi. We also learned this one in, in Shalam, which I, I did. But you could do it more with a fixed position, stra straightening out the hands, opening and closing fists. And you can do that for many minutes. You can do it above the head, you can do it to the side. So martial arts have lots of warming up and loosening exercises for the body. And they try to you know, work with the fingers, the all, all the joints, all the points, shoulders, hips, maybe even the kind of rib diaphragm might be spoken about. So some classes might be talking about the lat, the scapula, the lats. So you start to become more aware of your body and think, how can I move this? And it might even be micro movements, very, very small movements where you're just getting used to adjusting the shoulder. Others might be very macro, you know, larger motions where you're circling down, touching the floor. And, it really, and of course, that can be adapted according to the person's needs and their, also their, their potential. So some people may be, um, for example, in, in, often in a wheelchair, perhaps, or in, perhaps in a position where they, um, or they might be uh, some partially sighted. So movement can be adapted to their needs and their environment they're in so during covid for example maybe people more restricted martial arts still have the potential to be trained inside even though they might be in a larger hall typically or in a ring environment you could be doing it in your kitchen and perhaps you only have to step once or twice because you haven't got much space but as long as you're stepping and moving that's the most important thing um, and in terms of systems there are some innovators who've created who have a martial arts background who have mixed martial arts with say yoga um, and free training, the body weight training, and other calisthenics and those kind of things. Um, Edu Portal is one example. His movement culture. Um, he has a background in capoeira. He's also studied other martial arts and travelled uh, 
around the world, say to China, to look at Bagua and look at other arts um, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So th then they've also trained martial artists to help move them move better. So people like Conor McGregor and others like that. Um, Gunnar Nelson also trained with him. And then you've got um, Cameron Shane in the United States, who's um, a background in Taekwondo and Karate and, and more kicking arts, and but also Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So he's, he works with yoga and other kind of animal, animal motion um, exercises, such as the lizard, you know, the crawling exercises on the ground. And they help the, really develop the, the human in, in all its planes. So on the floor, face up, mm -hmm. maybe a face down on the side, and uh, jumping, leaping, crawling, rolling, all these kind of motions that humans can do. And both of them would say, even though they have their differences, what I found, <laughs> they, they, they would agree that humans are, are, are the best movers, really, that we, that we are. You know, all the things we can, our potential to, for, to move is, is, is amazing, which is probably why we have so many martial arts out there, whereas animals will fight in a certain way, like a bear will fight in a certain way, a lion will fight in a certain way, whereas humans go, okay, I'm going to go to the ground, I'm going to jump, I'm going to do a flying kick, I'm going to do a spinning kick, and none of the, no other animal can do so many things, and, then, and that's our potential to move, and of course, we only fight, maybe you never fight at all, hopefully you never have to fight, So, there's, but we always have to move every day, and and that's why becoming developing a human being through movement. So I think martial arts are one of the best vehicles, but it can be added on to other things that focus on possibly more static and different types of dynamic motion. Nice. Yeah. That's a really good overview. Thank you. Um, the other thing or one of the next things that you speak about is um, self-help. So this idea, or not this idea, but this reality where a lot of martial artists have actually gone on to write self-help books that might be for an audience of martial artists or non-martial artists hoping to um, gain inspiration or guidance in terms of what to do next in their, in their lives. What do you think are the positives and the negatives of learning self-help from martial artists or past martial artists? Okay, really good question. And um, I find it interesting that the people, you know, because anyone can write a self-help book. Um, so there's no necessary, necessary qualification. So it could be, in terms of the risk, it could be um, a bit dangerous if you're learning it, just, just uh, exclusively learning from a book and relying on that to guide your whole life. But if you are already, you do have, you already, say, so back with this metaphor on a vehicle, you're learning with a qualified instructor in a martial art, the book could supplement that. So it could talk, tell you about maybe diets or sleep patterns or hygiene and so a lot of these self-help books talk about cleaning your house looking at yourself um you know clean, almost cleaning and cleansing the mind as well if, you know healthy thoughts make sure you think in a healthy systematic organized way that um you're polite to whether you don't talk for example don't talk behind people's backs for example be real you know, so have some good advice for, for life i think having read the various books for for that chapter that i wrote um but maybe if you do focus exclusively on that um you may be missing out on the interactive social elements um and some people, you know, say that self-help is a, it's a bit ironic because you are relying on a book. You're not really helping yourself. You, you, you're you seeking help of a book written by another human being to um, get advice. Whereas that maybe you actually spoke to that person, had a dialogue and a conversation. It'd be more personal because they're, they're writing very broadly, very, in sometimes quite vague manner. And that's talking about people they know, things they've experienced which is good. But then it doesn't come to your experience. So you don't have a conversation with someone about what you've, try to what didn't work or did work for you and maybe they could also learn from you as well it's not just a one-way ticket so to speak so uh, whereas martial arts you sometimes you can create things or do things that the teacher might think oh that's quite interesting i might try that so it's, it's more two-way dialogue uh, i think you can you can find when you go out there and meet people yeah it's interesting i can't remember actually now if, if you wrote this or somebody else wrote this but i have definitely read recently that um the number one predictor for if someone was going to read a self-help book was if they had recently read a self-help book okay yeah I, I, maybe, maybe so, it wasn't me someone else but it sounds very that sounds great yeah i agree with that <laughs> so there's this idea that um people who read self-help books don't just read a self-help book and then are helped they continue mm. they continue yeah. to consume that type of content yeah. and like i am not throwing any kind of shade because i'm one of those people i love to read books like that because mm. i think it's very rare that you hear anything that's groundbreaking that you're like oh my god this has totally blown my mind mm. and i've never heard anyone conceptualize life like this it's mm. usually little reminders um and again as human beings we're always framing our lives through confirmation bias. So usually we're reading books and when someone says something we already agree with, it's like, oh yeah, that's a good reminder. And someone says something else, you're like, oh, that's kind of like, 
<laughs> pointless. Why would anyone do that? Or, you know, or you could find some reason for it. I'm often up on my high horse. Like, oh, actually, research shows that that's a bad idea. It doesn't fit my narrative about what I think self-improvement, you know, things that I want to bring more into my life hold. And I don't know that that's unique to martial arts. That's definitely not unique to martial arts-based self-help books. That probably, yeah, self-help um across the board but i do sometimes grapple with this idea about self-help books that really have a strong focus on discipline mm -hmm. um and i definitely wonder through my work how where discipline fits in of course there, there's i i think i do agree with the idea that creating some sort of a structure and having mm -hmm. some discipline then gives us the freedom to be creative and that's certainly true in terms of making sure that our base needs are met you know, having shelter and having food and, you know, you know, going to work regularly or finding a way to earn mm -hmm. income that doesn't harm anybody else and things like things like that in terms of discipline. But I think discipline at being the centre of everything is leading to kind of um, an overriding of our ability to listen to our bodies and to um, rest and to, you know, consider what other people might be experiencing and be more in community i think it's it, discipline is quite an individualistic pursuit yes um so I, that's what i wonder about the martial arts self-help books did you notice from reading a lot of them was there like a strong emphasis on that discipline piece and what's your opinion about it yeah i think there's a definitely an emphasis on the um in individual disciplines so the problem is it's very individualistic and it reflects our westernized culture so, so my book is primarily about the western content how martial arts especially east asian martial arts or aspects of them have been adapted or reinvented through say for reconstructed for the western context and it obviously suits the western mind to think about the self and the individual self-growth self-discipline self-confidence self-esteem etc so mm. it, it can be great but it does take away the social aspect and it can be quite selfish so people start thinking oh my time my discipline they're very disciplined i got to get up at this time i got to do this oh but you if someone says oh in your family or your friends could you help me with this and through i'm moving house or i'm doing, no no because I'm, I'm working on my back then or i'm doing you know <laughs> doing my core and that that's my you know abs day or something or whatever it is you can can be quite restrictive and very obsessive and I, you know i probably lived that myself when i was younger and my friends were like let's go out and i'm like no I'm, i've got to go to the gym or but it's fine it would help me keep active and develop you know the strength of whatever but maybe you can be too obsessed with i only got i only i've got to eat at this time i've got to have a snack at this time and and it kind of links to fitness magazines as well because i used to read men's health a lot when i was a student and become very obsessed i've got to have um you know olive oil on my tomato because this reduces the risk of cancer my housemates used to laugh at me <laughs> probably when i was a bit eccentric but i became very obsessed with advice and and people do take it literally and you said self-fulfilling prophecy and you, you think okay i'm confirmation bias i'll read more things and you start to accumulate these magazines accumulate self-help and then also it makes you feel maybe um, not always constantly dissatisfied with yourself because there's always something to improve on. And that's another thing that self-help research has found that it, it can be very self-critical and it can actually create maybe even sense of depression and anxiety because there's always something wrong with your body. There's always the, the, the books always say about your weight or about your breath or about your hygiene or about your relationships. You have not enough relationships. You have not this. There's always something wrong with you. You've got to deal with. Um, so that's another issue with self-help books, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Let's turn our attention now to one of our community's favourite topics, the use of martial arts as a way to address some issues that people might be experiencing with their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so in the book you talk about trauma-informed martial arts and you, you do use that language. So how would you define a trauma-informed martial art? Okay, so it's a martial art that's been um, adapted, again, imagined in, to have a different purpose. And it's focusing probably less on the problems in combat, or there will be that, but more, probably a little bit more emphasis on the problem in society. But the combat problem may be adapted, because you mentioned earlier about sparring, and when we had a chat earlier about, you know, do you spar, do you do the self-applications with, and say, the women who've experienced trauma or living with trauma? So it's really adapting a martial art for a group of people, often a specified group of people that have shared a, a common issue or event, maybe. Um, for example, it could be domestic violence, or it could be people living with anxiety, or um, maybe um, people with agoraphobia, people coming afraid to go outside and meet people. Um, and then what happens, the trauma, we go back to that actually, it's probably like a shock inside the body and mind, it's kind of in your whole being, based, from my understanding at least, very limited understanding, it's based on maybe an event that has been um, 
kind of lived and interpreted and, and, and retained inside yourself. So it's kept inside yourself, maybe through tension, through um, nightmares, through um, sweats, whatever. There's, there's some kind of expression of this in, in the body, typically, and in the mm -hmm. mind and, and emotions. It's, it's mental, emotional, physical, in many ways, a holistic um, issue based on how an event has been lived. And um, maybe two people have the same event, but one may be traumatized and one might not be. So it could be the same family, but some people have been traumatized by things that others didn't really worry about, but they had another trauma, traumatic experience elsewhere in their life. Okay, so the, now there's more awareness that trauma is, many people are traumatized. There are some estimations that a very high percentage of adults, for example, in say, the United States or Canada and those kind of countries where uh, Gabor Mate, for example, who's a, one, a Hungarian expert in trauma who's based in Canada, has given a large percentage estimate. Others maybe may vary. There's a lot more books out there now as well about trauma, like the wisdom of trauma. So is it, is it, you know, can we learn from trauma, for example, it's a very well-known book. Um, and then the trauma for martial arts, they're using martial arts to focus on those populations or people who have maybe gone through this and would possibly um, maybe struggle or have some issues with going to a regular martial arts group where people say, okay, just grab this person or touch this person on the chest or now we're on the floor, imagine this. And, and this trig triggers maybe uh, memories of a bad experience where they may have been attacked or maybe they had a childhood abuse or whatever it is. And this is something that you've got to adapt. You've got to teach in a more sensitive manner for them using certain language and certain uh, systematic ways to more gradual and gentle for those people so they don't get um maybe doesn't uh, make things worse really because it could easily and um, the trauma could get worse and they could have more psychological problems based on that yeah do less harm than yeah do exactly. good. yeah i think so definitely good motto yeah do no harm at least you try to do some some good but we try to i think the trauma reform martial arts try do no do no harm try not to try not to create new triggering memories and try not to traumatize or re-traumatize people hopefully they will keep it up the martial art keep active benefit from the movement benefit from the social interaction and a new identity a new potential identity for them the range of identities that are out there um and the flexibility martial arts offer and the learnings from other cultures they could learn about culture they can learn about history from martial arts hopefully yeah, yeah. and then what about a therapeutic martial art Okay, so the therapeutic martial art may, uh, has quite a close relationship to the trauma informed, I would say, because um, it's usually focused on a particular population or group. So it may also be a physical uh, difference that people may have. Uh, it could be for uh, children with uh, sort of learning difficulties or differences. Um, it could be for adults who are, or older adults, maybe, for example, who have a risk of falling. So judo, for example, has been adapted in Spain. The adapted yeah. utilitarian judo so that's be used for if you think of the bowing of judo so the, the japanese bow of course i'm mean, you do it much better but you know it's, it's very you know it's formal it's controlled it's very mindful of the motion and of course the tying of the belts and um, those kind of things that use, use the, the fingers and the control of the things they may have lost a little bit they may not be able to write so steadily with the handwriting and so this this might help these kind of um, these skills which you may take for granted in martial arts oh i'm just bowing i'm just tying my belt let's get to the training now but for them those basic aspects or sitting in the seiza or seiza position, the posture, <clears throat> that's quite hard for an older adult. So be able to actually fold your, your legs. Um, and uh, sorry, we went on the change window. Um, change, you know, fold your legs and, and control the ankle um, flexibility. That's really important to have that lower body kind of control and, and flexibility and strength. So martial arts like that, Tai Chi is one of the most studied ones. So it's been adapted and often associated now with older adults because it's gentle and it can be progressive and um, accessible but other martial arts like karate who which are often seen as more explosive and, and harder martial arts they can be used for older adults as well because they have a, they're developing a certain type of explosive strength a certain level of contact which may help bone density for example mm -hmm. so yeah so martial arts are going to be adapted for all these populations and it can be therapeutic in the sense of it's yeah, it's not necessarily an official therapy because it's fairly early days, but it has a few therapeutic benefits to helping people feel better about themselves, maybe benefiting their physical fitness and, and health, um, risk, reducing risk of falling, um, enhancing confidence and making new friends. And again, loneliness is a major issue in society. So if you work, go to class two to three times a week, you're making remembering names, helping for them, working on the memory, remembering names of maybe foreign language for them, the techniques. And um, that helps the brain as well. So learning new, new terms, which may they start to forget words or forget people's names and faces, they can start to try and learn new things. Yeah. yeah. I I am so, in, like, absolutely enchanted with the world that we have now, where there's so many ways you can have 
a career in martial arts that's meaningful in in a different way, right? I, I think I've probably people who listen to this podcast and heard me say this so many times, but I just think making the one percent one percent better. So working with someone who's already you know a really good fighter, a little mm. bit better at fighting for the purpose of winning fights, mm. just feels like not the you know I don't want to say meaningless, but it pales in comparison to something like you know improving somebody's bone density and meaning mm. that you know they're less likely to have a fall and even if they do have a fall um they're less likely to fracture mm. and i think now that there's more awareness around these type of modalities martial arts has also moved away from um this idea that it's something that you would have a day job and then you would train and teach you know in a rented hall mm. a couple of times per week i think now more and more we're seeing people who are able to carve out a pathway into a specified clinic or a clinic that runs i think in the future we're going to have a clinic that's like you know this time we run sessions for parkinson's and this mm. is our osteoporosis group yes. and that you know an exercise physiologist who's running it and so it's claimable you know in Australia, we have Medicare. So if it's a program like that, you know, you can claim it through the government healthcare system. Yeah. That's not here yet, but I think it's coming. Okay. Um, in in terms of the, that martial arts being listed on there, mm. you know, and as that research continues to build up, it becomes easier and easier to make that argument to you know insurance companies to say this is this is something. And I think for for people who are at that point, like the the new relationship mode I suppose I feel like everyone you meet in martial arts has this one time in their life where they were like uber obsessed to the point where it overtook everything else you know they didn't have much balance in their life they were like training studying tape watching instructionals like planning their training meal prepping so that they could have food to go so that they could train more and like that was it basically like everything revolved around it and knowing at that point where you're looking at how am I going to make this thing that I now want to have so deeply embedded in my life stay in my life mm -hmm. that the the options are no longer just you take an extreme gamble at becoming a top athlete and hope mm -hmm. that you don't get injured in the time that it takes to become a champion and hopefully you can monetize that and not end up with brain damage or you know long term um other long-term injuries mm. that you can go through and be like i really want to help this population and i think the work that i'm doing can contribute towards that i just mm. think it's like it's unprecedented and it's so beautiful mm. like it's so wonderful not just that we have these interventions but also mm. there are all these new career pathways for people to stay involved in the martial arts you know martial arts academics i didn't know yeah. that was a thing yeah. um, <laughs> when i was when i was a kid i certainly wasn't thinking that like that that's a possibility mm. um i don't know that i could do what all of you are at my amazing um, being able to just read and, and write all day and conceptualize that the the volume that you do as an academic would be I don't think it's still my my ambition but it's cool for kids now to be like oh there are mm. people who are doing this it's a thing yeah definitely I think you've got to as they say you can't be what you can't see isn't it and I remember I was inspired by uh uh, when my undergrad dissertation, I went to a library at the university, and there was a book on, by Philip Zarelli, the When the Body Becomes All Eyes, about a South Indian martial art called Kalari Payat, and it was an ethnography, so a study of a culture where he he went to India, he lived there, he studied it, he learned the martial art from scratch, and became a, an apprentice instructor, and, and, for, and, and interviewed lots of different teachers around the country. And for me, that's like, mm. wow, I'd really love to do that. I'd love to become a, a martial arts researcher. So that that was enabled by knowing there was someone out there who'd done that before. And now there's a lot more examples of that. So if you, you know, we go to the martial arts studies conference in the summer, you'll see, you know, a hundred or so, maybe, you know, or dozens at least of people who around the world who are studying certain martial arts, some of them very in depth, some people a broader perspective. And um, a lot of people are still very passionate, but it, it reminded me of, um, I was actually reading actually a self-help, <laughs> listening to self-help books, sorry, back to self-help, but actually Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, Be Useful book. So again, you might think the bodybuilding is, is a discipline. It can be seen as a bit selfish because it's about the body, your own body, your own physique. But he, from that, he, you know, he transferred it into an actor, then into a, a politician, the governor of California. And a, from his, that platform and his confidence and his charisma and things he developed in bodybuilding, he was able to help you know, thousands, if not millions of people 
even during the, when he wasn't the governor during the pandemic and help um, distribute medicine and, and uh, kits, for example, PPE kits for uh, medical practitioners. And so those things that he used in his uh, philosophy was be useful. So again, it, it transformed from the athlete and uh, young competitor to someone who's using their wisdom learned from that journey. So I think martial arts, you can definitely later in life, you might think of being a scholar because you've got the knowledge and you've read a lot, you've, you've witnessed a lot and you might, or you could just, I think what you're doing is great though, because I think you're bridging gaps between the academic side and then the practical side and you're getting the, the academic voices to platforms we don't normally go to and uh, to younger voice, the younger listeners potentially as well. Yeah. yeah, I love asking so what. It's my favorite question ever. You know, if somebody's like going to throw a theory out there or explain something, I want to know like, well, so what? What does that actually mean in practice? How does that work for somebody to be able to use? I think it's such a valuable question to be able to translate things back and it's been like i've been so privileged to have relationships with you know with yourself and with alex and you know with a few different people where i've been able to feed back and say like this paper was actually really useful um haven't really looked so much at this one but you know i really enjoyed this part of it and i'd like to see more of like you know this aspect where it gave clear actionable things that was really helpful you know as a as a practitioner because of course um that's the whole point of research. Definitely, and yeah, yeah. someone interprets it. Thank you. Yeah, you never know how people are going to read, and so I find that the most fascinating thing and fun, the fun bit of my of writing is that there, when you get hear from people like you who say, "Oh, would you like to be on a podcast? Would you like to talk about this?" And, and you've read bits in a different way than I expected, or you've interpreted or honed in on something, um, and that's great because everyone's going to read something in a different way, and they'll highlight things that they like or, or perhaps they they're perhaps not relevant for them right now, at least. Um, yeah, so that's one of the, the unexpected, you know, expect the unexpected, I think, in this in the world of research and writing and martial arts, because you never know who's around the corner. Uh, you know, as you meet someone in an event or a competition and, and like, you know, I don't plan too much because I feel that, that everything flow, goes with the flow. I think there's another philosophy. Don't, don't be too disciplined. So I must do this 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 year, set these uh, six month goals, because I don't know next, the, half, the second half of the year I might have an opportunity to work with a colleague on an exciting project or to co-author a book or something. So I'll leave things a bit more open. I think. Hell yeah. Yeah. Let yeah. the universe intervene wherever you get into that. Yeah. Um, now, that's kind of the first half of your book where you look at these applications and then you pivot into some other ideas, which I had never heard about until I read this book. So one is um, another acronym, HEMA, Historical oh, yes. European Martial Arts. Yes. Um, I suppose there are probably other countries that are, are studying more like their historical martial arts. And I think um, particularly as an Australian, this was really fascinating to learn about um, our culture in Australia. Of course, we have one of the oldest living cultures in the Indigenous peoples, but we um, exist in the colonised country that was really recently colonised. Um, and there hasn't been in Australia, for example, at least not that I'm aware of, a study of Indigenous martial arts that's mm. come to the forefront. But over over with our, you know, friends in the in the UK, there's this rich history of, of um, martial arts that were, you know, perhaps with all with weapons, or was there were there examples historically without weapons, or is it very like sword heavy? That was my um, impression. Yes, it seems to be quite sword heavy and weapons heavy, although there are the wrestling and um, some of the manuscripts show wrestling and unarmed combat. Um, mm. there's dag it goes down to dagger and sword, even the combination of sword and dagger. And then there's some wrestling uh, techniques where they were used, maybe they didn't have their weapons. But it's primarily is, um, I mean, there are different modalities. Some have, have classified like Daniel Jacquet and his team of researchers in Switzerland and Europe have said that there's the uh, HEMA, historical European martial arts with armor. So, um, on horseback and then there's armor off horseback so just two people fighting and there's also people uh, dueling with without armor with weapons and then there's obviously unarmed combat so and some people might classify certain wrestling ancient wrestling styles um so in, in iceland or maybe um in scotland and, and highland wrestling maybe an element is historical in the sense it has an eight, a, a long history of technique and it's continued to this day but others would say the things that have died out are more full of HEMA. So HEMA is typically the reconstruction of lost martial arts that maybe okay. lost over time, or they they did evolve. I mean, they, we do have their um, descendants. You know, for example, boxing. We have boxing. We have fencing. We have wrestling. Mm -hmm. That's three elements. Where if you go strip them back in time, or go back in time, 
people would have be able to use a sword. They would have been able to use their hands and maybe take people down or even kick in some older uh, Western box actually did include some kicks and headlocks, but this evolved mm -hmm. and changed over time. So it was a bit more complex. They were more kind of complex, uh, like a complete like a martial artist you might associate with. It was less rule bound. So he is yeah, really popular in, in the Western world. Um, I know it's also in Latin America and other, I think even Japan also has Hema. So even though they have their own martial arts, there seems to be an interest in the European thing and maybe helped by Hollywood and, and, and knights and, and the idea that mm. you can train like a knight really. You can learn all the techniques and sort of the, the long sword, the double handed long sword, which is the, the most iconic uh, weapons in, in Hema. But you could also learn a sword and dagger. You can use shield and sword, or a sword and buckler, which is a small shield. So that often you, you can learn a, a great variety of weapons, and as as um, to say, developed by certain fencing masters. Um, often the Italian and German traditions in the 13th, 14th century up to 15th century, or slightly later sometimes, and they were called fight fight books or manus or fighting manuscripts. Um, and people start to interpret them back to the interpret imagination interpretation of thinking how it would you know because they wouldn't have didn't have any videos then so it just it, pictures and drawings and some brief descriptions and so mm -hmm. people say oh this is how you start to work with these plays which are sequences um, mm -hmm. so they think, oh, you do this this and often it's four five six steps and then you get into a place where you counter someone's thrust and then you'd be able to to hit them or, or to strike them and disarm them and then it, and it also it extends to sparring so him is now also a a sport because there are competitions and rankings and and those kind of things so and the governing gets some types of governance in emergence as well yeah so that's one example how, of, yeah sorry <laughs> how do you compete in HEMA because would um you not get very injured fighting someone with a sword okay good question there's um there, there are synthetic swords they're made with usually recycled kind of plastic um, mm -hmm. material and there is a protection so you wear them um, typically um head gear um which mm -hmm. protects the face and the side of the head sometimes the, they also protect the back of the head throat often throat protection um a chest um protection as well so you also the wrist and hands so the hands and wrists have to be covered and um, sometimes your groin guards are encouraged because that can also <laughs> you never know where it can go wrong um, yep. and some people even use knee and um, shin protection because not necessarily always um, inspiring you might be able to hit the leg um or you might be able to do you know Try to take some more trips someone so often they yeah. look a bit like robocop you know like this kind of an armored person who's um you know and, and it can be very hot one of the challenges of hema is the heat i think it's an interesting topic how you fight with all this armor on and this protection with your probably your uniform or t-shirt underneath as well mm. uh, and they're, they're, it's regulated that you've got to have the right equipment for the right weapon so if you have a certain sword that, that has a that has force of so many newtons then this helmet should be able to take those and there's also then synthetic well there's them um, Blood, they're steel, but it's not sharp steel. So you can fight with steel swords, but they are not obviously sharpened. So they're blunt. So you can hit someone, you're not going to actually kill, take their head off or kill them. And, and the helmet should be strong enough to take the impact. However, I would say there's, there's going to be some research later. I think, I believe there's still some potential risk to the brain. So it's not maybe as bad as direct as boxing and MMA. Mm. Um, but we know from American football and other things that, you know, the hits to the head, even with a helmet. Kind of an impact and people you know getting hit with larger weapons full on so it'd be interesting seeing hema back into that element can can it be sustained or their risks people some people like keith farrell who's a, a scottish instructor who he starts to show that we need to wear maybe wear a rugby scrum cap underneath the helmet so there's so it has to be adapted now with these modern considerations there's a there's a risk in society a consideration to a perceived problem in society so this perceived problem is the safety aspect now and then mm. concussion so it's, it's going to be adapted more readily, I think. Yeah, it's so interesting because I feel like I recoil more, I think, for the like the brain injury of somehow <laughs> being like hit in the head with a <laughs> weapon. Yeah. Seems like I've been punched in the face so many times, but yeah. like getting hit in the head with a weapon just makes me feel like oh, that feels, um, oh, I mean, of course, I'm much more aware of the concussion risks now than I was when I was in my youth and competing in, mm -hmm. in Muay Thai. But, um, yeah, it's so interesting that it's, it from from reading your book, my impression was that it's it's growing in popularity, mm -hmm. this, um, like, I think, and I, I say this in the nicest way, I think it's a compliment to be a nerdy sport. I think a lot mm -hmm. of martial arts are quite nerdy sports, to be yeah. honest, but it's like an exceptionally nerdy thing where you've got, like, your sword collection and you're, like, mm -hmm. reading these historical things and you're reading mm -hmm. history books and you're, like, cross-referencing things and it's got some, you know, similarities to, um, 
like you know people who do all of the olden day reenactments and um yes. you know things like that and they think about yeah. what kind of material would they have had access mm. to and how do they make things and um just like some cool little nerdy sport which i i on, on activity i would think more hobby hobby than sport even though you can compete yeah. with it feels like hobby but yeah what are, what are some of the the benefits of studying a historical martial art do you think yeah i think that you've touched on a really important point i'd like to write about in the future is the idea of the embodied geek because there's one a guy interviewed who's from another hema school and he is an mm. academic so he had certain terms like embodied for example so he said these are geeks but these are embodied geeks so so they are people who are situated in their bodies who are very in touch with their body even though they play games and they board get board games video games they watch you know start star trek and all these kind of things lord of the rings marathons and they, they are kind of the, the geeky aspects so i think one aspect is that this kind of um martial arts or hobby is accessible to what you might call a geek you know someone who's uh, self-identified as a nerd or a geek because they may not do a normal a regular sport like uh, football or soccer or aussie rules or whatever you know whatever sports popular in the country or cricket they might associate that with more kind of the jocks or the sporty types of athletes but they do feel that they, you know, because they they're fantasy they can live out the fantasy of childhood or youth that they watch some of the people that mentioned them um, in the group I studied, uh, Highland, they watched Highlander as younger, so they were inspired by Highlander, they were inspired by Game of Thrones, and so this kind of fantasy aspect, they can live out this fantasy, so I think Hema could allow you to live out a fantasy, and if you just still live in this kind of, you, you say, this universe, this is brilliant, it gets you active, it gets you meeting people that maybe another sport wouldn't enable you to do. Um, mm. and at, the same, at the same time, it helps you think about cultural heritage and history, that help you mm. think critically about sources and ideas. And also be creative because the hema is one area where you could possibly create or or develop a new way of doing a technique or for example disarming someone's sword and ra wrapping around the arm and taking out the sword and i remember doing one partner exercise with another classmate and he managed to do something and wrap and he had disarmed my sword in a quite creative way and the teacher thought oh, i haven't thought of that so he'd created a new way I know I'm quite aware the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is one example where the te new techniques might be created. So it's not so set in stone. Um, mm. it, there's lots of gaps in the literature and, and the, the surviving manuscripts where, where there was a bit of grey area. Did they, what do they do before then? How did they quite get? Is there another way of doing that? What if you fight with a, a left handed person? Because most of the books were written with a right handed person in mind based on the historical society where being left handed was stigmatized still based on the devil or the religion aspect. So being left-handed myself, I found a lot of people thought, oh, how do we do it against you? So people have to adapt to the person that we now can use both sides because our society accepts, at least in the Western society, accepts that more now. Yeah, so I think those are, those are for me, are not fairly odd. Obviously, beyond the, the cardio, I mean, it's great for you know, health and well-being, cardio, and and yes. um, I, think, I think it expands to, yeah, I think hobby is a good way of looking at it because I found there's a there's HEMA, but there's a, it, it, it's an open space. The gates are open to other ways of doing things. They often do uh, Dungeons and Dragons. They do a game board nights. They do movie nights. They, so there's a lot of so, a social world where they live a certain life of leisure, an allegedly mm. life where they live to have fun. You know, that's good. Yeah, so it's great. They enjoy life. You know, I think HEMA is part of that, but they, they open their arms to other people to join them for the movie nights, maybe the partners and play Netflix at the same time and have jokes about these films. So yeah, I find that that was the, I mean, the lockdown really showed that highlighted what they are all mm. about. Yeah. I like it. It's interesting. Yeah. I feel like I, I always describe myself as being very agnostic across martial arts that I've like dabbled in mm. most, most styles, but I've mm. certainly never done anything like that. It'd be interesting to try. Yeah, sure. There probably That's is something like near you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know whether it's much of it. Oh, I had heard of one group in Sydney here oh, um, that was actually like a queer run group. I thought it was like okay. queer Emma, and I was like, mm. that is probably one of the coolest things I've ever heard. Yeah. Um, coolest yeah. nerdiest things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, there seem to be what I've listened to the podcast about HEMA. There seem to be groups that are run female run and LGBTQ plus friendly. There's a lot. Obviously, there are some HEMA groups that are at the same time. It's not all wonderful because there are some groups that are more on the right wing slash neo Nazi groups who are very nationalist, very purist about European heritage. You might think there are does attract some people with some fascist tendencies sometimes because they're quite militant. It's a way of thinking. This is what our ancestors mm -hmm. did. These are warriors, and we. And any martial art has this, this kind of historical tent can attract those types of people as well sometimes. Uh, but, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I've been fortunate to have trained and studied a group that wasn't like that, but uh, I've been told about the other ones, who say. <laughs> yeah. yeah.
I mean, like as as with anything. Yeah. Um, now, are we about to run over time? Can we have 10 more minutes or do you need to run? Oh, yeah, it's fine, actually. I'm lucky to, to be free this morning, so, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings me to my next question, which is about the role that martial arts might play in decolonizing our ideas and also how we might decolonize martial arts. Um, so for, we might start by explaining that as a concept. Um, we think about decolonizing our thinking or decolonizing something. Can you just explain to people who might not be familiar with that what that means? Again, explain it like we're 14. Okay, sure. So the, the, to understand decolonizing, we probably need to understand uh, colonizing. So colonizing was a, a, a process that's still going on in many ways. It's um, where the empires, typically European-led empires, but others as well, have uh, expanded mm -hmm. the territory, often overseas to different continents. You might think Australia, Georgia, as a British colony. So Britain and Australia are really far apart, but in Austria, and the British uh, obviously occupied the coast, lots of move inland and then take away land from the indigenous people, and maybe um, possibly ban certain practices or make it very difficult for them to continue their, their way of life, um, mm -hmm. maybe through agriculture, uh, maybe through language, banning a certain language or religion that's seen as yep. a, maybe dev kind of devilry, whatever it is, and imposing mm -hmm. a one relig religion state or one language state and also a westernized view of the world. So what, what the world is like, maybe renaming places. So I know that Australia is very well known for that. So there's lots of British names for you know nelson this or you know wellington that and you know lots of the generals and, and little male kind of names as well of the certain leaders of military might of the british empire mm. they had you know captain cook street whatever you know captain cook so we have these kind of words where they, they name these roads after these people who are associated with the colonization so decolonizing mm. is kind of questioning this and seeing this as a, a bit of a problem because it narrows the world view into one world view which is typically the modern western rationalized view and doesn't look at maybe other worldviews and religions and and uh, forms of knowledge. Um, so martial arts, as we know, that they are global practices around the world. So they may come from Thailand or China, or might come from uh, Cambodia, or, or maybe also Latin America and Africa, and also, lots of continents. There are different ways of knowing about the, the combat, but also knowing about the body, and knowing about health and medicine, about family relationships, about ancestry, about history. So by studying the martial arts, you often are tapping into an older or more worldly or alternative form of knowledge. Um, so they can be a gateway to thinking about this. Um, so decolonizing is a process where so we, we slowly strip away these, you know, maybe the processes that have started hundreds of years, maybe 400, 500 years ago or more, and start to question about, like, is there another way to look at this? Uh, is there another way to look at the body and my health and my breathing and my posture beyond the Western medical view or beyond, um, you know, perhaps the way of looking at the universe or looking at relationships? So it can be useful. Not everyone, um, not all martial artists say are doing this actively. They may not be thinking about it that way. It is an academic term, but it is a, now people are more conscious of this through the history of the country and, and uh, how they were colonized. So martial arts are one, one uh, I think, a popular way of doing it because they're, they're so widespread and active in many towns around the world, towns and cities and even villages, that there might be ways of, of touching that. And maybe yoga might be another example, meditation or other things that have non-Western origin might help us uh, approach this. Yeah. And then in terms of martial arts, I loved hearing about the example that you spoke about in Mexico, um, yeah. where I could be wrong, but what I can remember is that they, they, they didn't have like an old style to do like the hammer equivalent in Mexico because that had all been lost through the yeah. pra practice of colonization and so they were imagining what a mexican martial art that was you know pre-colonization might have looked like and practicing that um as an act of of decolonization so could could am i right in that and also could yeah. you say more about it? yeah definitely yeah so there are several mexican martial arts were relatively recently invented because the founders are still alive um so I, mm -hmm. I was able to when i lived in mexico i studied shalam for one year so i was I did a study where I became a member, so the ethnography of, of mm -hmm. Shilam. Um, but there are, I, during the, as I came back to UK, I started to realise there were more out there, so I started to write about them as well. So all of these martial arts essentially are inspired by the, the pre-Hispanic, so before the Spanish conquest uh, cultures, such as the Aztecs, the Maya, the Zapotec, and other kind of civilized expressions that we call Mesoamerica, Middle American civilization, with the pyramids and all the different deities and ideas and mm. their wisdom and knowledge so these again the, with the spanish conquest so the colonization colonizing process 
they wipe, often wiped out the warrior caste or they ban, ban them from using certain weapons and drums and things associated with warfare dances um which basically meant the warrior arts fighting arts you might call them martial arts whatever you want to call them so there's some people argue that they were fighting a warrior arts and then the martial arts are a bit more modern which is a fair understanding so would well, these martial arts have a more idea of developing the person uh, helping a better society so they're not really for war per se so they're more for developing human be self -cult shared cultivation really so you cultivate yourself you cultivate each other you help hopefully make a better society out there mm. uh, as and they learn um, indigenous terms so there are still some indigenous languages in mexico a large number actually and mm. many of them have techniques that they learn for the names of animals for the numbers so again it, this is the idea of this gateway so there's a gateway for you to learn say about the maya language or the Nahuatl language or others is it's a gateway for you to think about the the religion slash philosophy or scientific and the scientific elements of this um, and it's a way to look at the alternative kind of history and perspective on on the country and where it's going and, and be proud of of their indigenous heritage and roots because there's still a, a lot of stigma attached to being indigenous based on that colonization process where the europeans are seen as the white europeans are seen as superior the catholic religion was in many ways imposed and spread very rapidly and um, other forms of religion and ideas are seen a bit more primitive um, so therefore the, these martial arts help them feel proud that they're descended or they might be descended from those kind of aztec or they're living at least they're living in a country where it has those roots because also they may be descended from immigrants or migrants as well yeah it's so fascinating to me and we're kind of going full circle to thinking about things being less black and white mm -hmm. um and i think that's such a helpful frame to have when we think about what are things that i'm doing almost on autopilot because that is what is embedded in um my culture which is western culture which is mm -hmm. so widespread mm -hmm. um so like an example more more recently for the work that we've been doing was going and facilitating trauma-informed kickboxing in El Salvador okay. um, in thinking about trauma-informed, this idea of, of um, trauma-informed, and you gave the same definition, right, is talking about an event um, mm -hmm. or it could be many events that is in the past mm -hmm. that is impacting us in the present. And that's yeah. really this whole concept of trauma mm -hmm. is that it's something that happened in the past but is impacting us in the present. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a lot of space for people who are living with ongoing trauma, people mm -hmm. who are living with ongoing violence, even mm -hmm. though there are people living with ongoing violence in every country. Yeah. We think mostly about people who have been freed from that violence and are now moving on with their lives. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to think about um, that concept, uh, but also things that you, you know, we might take from, for example, Salvadoran culture that could be valuable to bring back into the work that we're doing. And rather than saying, you know, the way that we do things is the way to do things, mm -hmm. thinking about, you um, you know where there where there could be value, or you know, talking to people and seeing, um, like yeah, what the benefit is of embedding other things. So, like an example in in our work has been this idea of Salvadoran time, which I think every a lot of not every country, but so many countries have this same like, Brazilian time, Thai time. <laughs> I think being in a martial art, they'll be like, oh, if you do Muay Thai, they'll be like, oh, they're on Thai time. If you do Jiu Jitsu, I'll say, oh, they're on. Brazilian time mm. in El Salvador they're on Salvadoran time mm. in Indonesia they have Indonesia like it's it's mm. a it's a really common mm. phenomenon mm. outside of Western culture I think mm. this idea yeah. that you can be late um yeah. and I think that's really interesting to bring into martial arts because they're often very regimented and my experience has mm. been you know if you're late you're punished with push-ups and then you're mm. allowed to join the class and things like yeah. that which I just detest because I'm you know people are, are, I think, allowed to be human and make mistakes. And I think it's very rare that people are just disrespectfully showing up late because they don't care about everybody else. It's mm. much more commonly something something happened or, you know, yeah. I'm just doing my I'm just doing my best. And so that's been something that's been really fun to bring back into our world, being like, how can we be more on Salvador in time for our clients? You know, yeah. come later. It doesn't matter. Um, we just want you to show up. I, I hate the idea that because we've got these rigid rules around time, then people might realise that they're going to be late and decide not to come because they don't want to be the late person. Mm, definitely. So, yeah, that's what I've been thinking about lately relating to potentially decolonising our ideas, and I'm still very new to it and, and also very aware of my 
position as somebody who benefits from colonization in Australia. And there's a lot of conversation about that as we, depending on when this podcast comes out, maybe we're about to hit the 26th of January, which um, officially is Australia Day, but okay. broadly known as yeah. Invasion Day. Mm-hmm. Um, and interestingly, is the day that we celebrate is the day um, of a very significant massacre um, of Indigenous peoples here. Um, very contentious issue mm. in in Australia today, and so you know, a very topical thing to think about. Um, I think so valuable to learn just more about other ways of doing things, and if we can do that through martial arts, like you say, that could be a gateway for doing that. Yeah. Um, I think that's so so valuable, especially being able to bridge like ideas like that outside of academia. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, definitely. I like that. I can relate to the the time aspect because I'm a lot of my classmates joke that I'm late, and if they they come later, it's like, I can't be later than George, can I? So I I'm I'm a bit like that, you know. Usually five or ten minutes. Like, so I'm sorry, I'll be ten minutes late, and I come in. I feel embarrassed myself, but it's not a bad intention. I think a lot. But for me, it's the most important thing. I'm constant. I'm always there every week. Um, whereas yeah. some people are on time, but they don't come back the next week. So I think, that, but it's not, you know, I, I agree. I can relate to that. And maybe it's part of me living in another culture for a few years as well, being more relaxed, and more flexible with time. And um, there's a perception, you know, time is a major thing to think of how we perceive time and are we time? Do we have time? Is something that's an enemy, treated as an enemy as well? Uh, it's taken mm. so seriously. And then that's back to self help. A lot of self help books about managing your time, micromanaging every hour, every second, trying to make you a productive human being, you know, all the time, you've got to achieve something every day, you've got to do this, rather than maybe enjoying and taking your time to just enjoy, finish your meal and more, you know, I only got half an hour for my lunch and I've got to wolf it down because I've got to finish my emails. I think it's going to teach us a lot about about life really and to live a better, richer life. Yeah, that was another thing that I took away from your book is the value of doing things that are more moving meditation based and and certainly more slowed down like the Tai Chi. Um, what did you, Tai Chi, um, but that's not what it's, how you're supposed to say it. Or, uh, uh, tai Chi Chuan? Tai Chi Chuan. So Chuan, yeah. Chuan, yeah. Yeah, it'd probably be wrong. Again, Chinese like, is a, a Mandarin is a very hard language, so I'm probably saying it wrong um but i'm saying it in a western way but most people say tai chi because it's easier to say but tai, tai chi chuan i think is the the way to pronounce it um yeah yeah i think it's but, important to be willing to fail at speaking other languages yeah. so many people so. have to be willing to try and fail at speaking english back <laughs> yeah exactly. try a few a few little words and it's fun i think so and it humbles you i think martial arts helps to keep you grounded and humbled because you're learning words that you breathe you have sorts of self-doubt about your ability to do a technique correctly the ability to pronounce the technique and understand its root and and the history you think oh i'm not i might not be right i think the martial arts help you say that you're not 100 percent right all the time and mm. we can be more grounded in that way yeah. now if anybody wants to go through and read this book to be honest you've got so many spoilers we've pretty much covered everything that the book covers except for we didn't go go through um mcdojo's um oh, yeah. but otherwise we really spoke about most of the book so you're very welcome george is very generously basically giving you this um unprecedented access to his um <laughs> i think musings over a, a very long career in martial arts academia really that's what it feels like this book is kind of a combination of things that you've been mulling over for a long time yeah thank you i think the book allowed me to bring things together that often i've well, before it's my first book by the way so i've only written articles and book chapters in other people's books so i thought it's about time mm-hmm. i have a book and then the series editor J.A. Mangan who's a sports historian wrote to Paul Bowman in martial arts studies kind of guy and he afforded it to me and a colleague Alex Channon who you mentioned and I thought oh, I'll take this up this opportunity so I was really grateful to I'll give a shout to the series editor Professor Mangan for his his support as well um, and yeah the book for me is, is it enabled me to go detail into something put things together different topics in one place and so you've got things like self-help and McDojo's and and the people's also people's in-depth uh, case study stories as well. So I like to hit, hit I, and I found that was, it's different. I mean, some, there are some criticism that is a lot going on in the book and maybe it's not a, a golden thread, but I think this this talk has enabled me so that it is all con- interconnected and maybe the right, hopefully the writing expresses it. Um, you know, there's people's life is, is framed by ideas of self-improvement, about movement, about maybe trauma and considerations of their childhood problems. Um, and it's also considered about how martial arts can be adapted for different needs and how they need to adapt to their students. Or those around them so 
I, I really enjoyed uh, writing the book. It was a challenge, but I, I'm glad it's out there and people are reading it and reviewing. So feel free to get in touch with me um, if you'd like to send me an email about the book or to discuss things. Um, it's with P published by Peter Lang, which is an academic publisher it's based in Germany and Switzerland and around the world as well. Um, uh, there is, of course, academic books are quite expensive, so hopefully it will get a bit cheaper for uh, wider members of the public. So universities can get it for their libraries, and if you have a local university, you might be able to access it for you. Um, but otherwise, we can be in touch, and I can send you um, other articles. I have a, a, some open access articles which are free to read, so um, you can have a read of, you can look at George Jennings, Google George Jennings Martial Arts, or Google Scholar is another way of you use a type of uh, element of Google engine. And you can find out um, George Jennings Martial Arts, you'll find quite a lot of my publications. You can download the PDF for free and feel free to get in touch. My email is uh, gbjennings at cardiffmet, all, all one word, dot ac dot uk, ac being academia and uk being United Kingdom. So that's hopefully you'll have that. So I look forward to hearing from anybody and yeah, th thanks for listening and watching. <laughs> Yeah, and we'll put all of those details in the show notes so you don't have to pull out your pen, of course. Um, but highly recommend, and I will also say that a lot of even non-university libraries, if you request a book, they'll get books in. They're so happy for people to be borrowing books from libraries. At least that's been my experience oh, with cool. local libraries here in um, Australia. So uh, you can go to universities or you can go to libraries to try and get books in to, to make it accessible. Um, if you want to continue doing doing the deep dive of the read. But my hope really was to bridge some of that gap a little bit between maybe people who don't have access to funds to be able mm -hmm. to purchase a book and they really can't get access to it. Mm -hmm. There's no audio book yet. Um, so that this podcast hopefully will give you a little bit of an, an overview of the book, which really is, like you said, it's an exploration about some alternative applications to martial arts and the ways that they can better um people in our society and like I said at the start I really do think the common thread is that all of those things have some um happening in the body they're very connected mm. um to to the body and I know you do have a, a, a great paper about embodiment um and martial arts that was written with Alex Channon yes. which I'll also put in the show notes yeah brilliant thank you yeah I think that but the, the body and that's probably why there's the physical aspect in my definition as well is the center of the definition it's kind of subtly placed in the center but it's a crucial that there's the body there as we had discussed at the beginning of the interview so or the podcast episode so definitely I think the body for probably I'm always looking at the martial arts with relating to how people use their bodies and connect to other bodies and think about the body so that's probably one ongoing theme the last 15 years of, of writing about it so hopefully for years to come yeah oh i will actually shout out we're going to run a webinar very soon so it's going to be on the 2nd of february um at 8 30 a.m australian time i'm not sure what that time is in the uk but there is going to be a recording the webinar is called the in brackets combat athletes close brackets body keeps the score so the body keeps the score um bessel van der kolk's work and the thought about how trauma is stored in the body talked about all through the context of martial arts so how that impacts survivors as they show up into training spaces what that means in terms of bodily disconnection and dissociation how martial arts can be more harmful than helpful in that case but then also how they can also be helpful um oh that's brilliant. It's gonna be fun. Oh, great i could have to try and look at my diary in the time and then see if i can join you so that sounds perfect because i've been starting to read the book myself so It'd be really nice oh, to see how you're taking out of ten. Highly recommend yeah. the book. Absolutely yeah. make sure you read it. Be very timely to read it at the same time mm -hmm. as, our, as our stuff. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's an awful time to do our morning for the UK. So you might have to do the recording. I'm sorry. No, no problem. The recording is good because you can look back at it and pause it and take notes and things. It's great. Thanks. So, awesome. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Georgia. <laughs> Thank you for being part of the club. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to get in touch, please refer to the information in the show notes. If you'd like to support this podcast, please consider leaving us a review or subscribing on whichever platforms you use to listen or watch the podcast. The Conscious Combat Club acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands in which we work, live and play. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We'd like to say thank you to Nari for the beautiful song no Shape Me heard at the beginning and end Nobody of every episode. Me, me. If you'd like to connect with Nari, you can find her on Instagram at Nari the Saga.
Don't gotta tell you what my name is, I don't gotta explain it. Walk in the room, hear a boom erupting like I'm famous. I'm here shedding shells, I'm shameless. I fear nothing, no complacence. Walk to many tight ropes with no hope, so I became this poster they hold over all the heads of trauma holders. You don't need to know my history, I move boulders. Atlas shrug, cause I lifted the weight above his shoulders. No pretense of defense, move first like chess soldiers. This goes deeper than empowerment, cause huh, I'm the one that power it. Physical meets mental challenge me to keep devouring. If I can't change the scenery, at least I change perspectives. No longer isolated, but elevated and selective. Darkest places become beautiful spaces. This is where rage meets patience. Meets power meets gracious. Meets, we're so glad you came in. The feeling is contagious. When you the walking impact of intended bad intentions. When you the manifest enough collecting all they tensions. You the soul and body hold it all and still remember. But I'm a work in progress, testament to all contenders. Forgot what it was like to have control over self. Forgot what it was like to be the one in charge. Forgot in my reflection, I could see all my wealth. Forgot that with my bare hands, I break all these bars, barriers, and obstacles. They can't cage me, they can't chronicle all my experiences and reduce them to appearances. When I was truly beaten, gave myself clearances to fall down, mess up, and get myself back up. I'm not looking for clovers, cause I don't believe in luck. Damn, you were badass, I heard them say it clearly. Why, thank you very much, I know now I'm not weary of what's next for me. Cause I expect to see growth like I was planted, watered, fed, and bloomed to be. The positivity and accountability, knowing they won't step if I'm the agent of my agency. I think I found my voice again, huh? I think I found my voice again, huh? I'm not sorry, I'm not sorry, you're the end where I begin. Boundaries, I know them well. Take a breath and meditate. Who is she? I know her well. Now I get to open gates. One, two, one, two. I don't need your permission. And if you get uncomfortable, then use your intuition to know that I won't stay where respect is ever missing. And everything I do, that's me making decisions. It's truly underrated, the value of self-worth. Forgot that I was rich from the moment of my birth. A penny for my thoughts, no reason. You can't afford it, you cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it, huh?